Good evening, everyone. We're just waiting for more attendees. I see that they're being let in. So just give it a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, welcome everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm absolutely delighted to have such a wonderful turnout for our first meeting. Uh, for you, for those of you who don't know me, I am Sharan Shanmugam, the chair of the SIC Durban Committee, and my co-host uh, for this evening is Professor Mohammed Mustafa from UKZN. Uh, welcome, Professor. Uh, Professor is an academic with a passion for research in, on sustainable roads and the teaching of engineering subjects. And he's um, an academic manager and obviously a professional engineer as well. He has more than 26 years of working experience. Uh, he's worked in the UK, he's worked in Egypt, and now he's based at UKZN in here in South Africa, obviously. He has published over 40 articles and uh, his most recent is entitled The Sustainable Waste Alternative as Cement Replacement for Pavement Stabilization. So before we proceed any further, um, I would like to again welcome all our attendees and I would like to bring to your attention some housekeeping rules so that we can make this event more valuable for everybody who's present tonight. Please note firstly that the event is being recorded. Um, your videos and audio are disabled. Should you wish to speak, please send me a message directly uh, towards the end of the presentation and I will give you the opportunity to speak then. Uh, post any questions using our Q&A function. We will obviously address these during the panel discussion. And then please use the chat function uh, to connect with your industry peers and to as well give us feedback on the event. Okay, so the Infrastructure Lecture Series is an initiative that was brought to life by UKZN to give their final year civil engineering students a chance to network with the industry and also to get a look at what they can expect as they transcend into the next phase of their careers. At IC Durban, we took the opportunity to broaden the reach of the event to our members both in Durban and nationally of the progress we have made during these trying times. So with that, welcome to our first in the 10 week lecture series. Uh, we are so proud to be collaborating with Sanlam, who is our main sponsor. They have supported us graciously through, these, through this year to date, and I am so grateful for that. With this, it gives me great pleasure to introduce um, Ms. Michelle Bamba, who is the sales manager for Sanlam KZN. She joined Old Mutual in 1988 and is a BCom graduate. Um, she also has a postgraduate diploma in financial planning. She heads up the team of uh, financial advisors here in KZN. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, and thank you for having us. It is so exciting to be here. I'm not too sure if you can see my screen and if it is, there we go, thank you. So thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here. It is, it is really a privilege for us to be able to share this 10 week journey with you um, and, to, and to enrich your lives in some way. And I have no doubt that we will do that. Our whole role here is to just expose you to a little bit of Sunlam but more importantly, to teach you about the financial planning process and what you can expect. And we're finding that as students come out of their training, they need this more and more. We want you to understand the why, the what, and the how of, of what you're going to expect when you come out. 
And we also want you to understand the different aspects of the process. So why Sunnam? Sunnam has a new motto, and that new motto is to live with confidence. There, we are committed to providing not just our staff, but also our clients and new prospects with confidence. Confidence in our products, in our claims, in our performance, in our knowledge, and confident that we will keep you and your families protected. We will look after your dreams and we will make your wealth creation. It's a promise that as a business, we don't take lightly. So how do we do this? Well, the financial planning process is legislated. So to do this, you have to follow the six step process. The first, establish the relationship, a professional relationship. And we take that to the end. I mean, confidentiality is extremely important to us. We need to be able to have a relationship with you so that you can trust us. You are trusting us with your lives, with your money, with the decisions that you want to make, understanding that we know what is going to be best for you. And that's important. If you do not trust somebody or you don't think that you can work with somebody as a financial advisor, don't. We're expecting this to be a lifelong journey for you. The second point is we want to know everything about you. So we need to gather all that information and that includes your goals. We need to understand how do you treat money? What is your relationship with money and why? What are your thoughts about money? Those are the type of conversations that we actually want to have with you. We take all that information away and we use a, a financial planning process, a, a tool called the Sandfind Analysis Tool. And we evaluate the situation and we come back and we develop and we present you with those, with those recommendations. And those recommendations are unique to you because everybody is different. And we understand that. Some might have debt, others might not. Some might need different types of cover. Some might have a history of familial disease and need cover for that. So it's very important that we understand you and the situation to be able to give you the best recommendations that fit you. A one size does not fit all. Once we've had the discussion and you understand the recommendations, we then implement the recommendations and then we do a review annually. Now that review annually is legislated. However, it doesn't mean that if things change in the year, so for example, you get married or you have a different job or you get retrenched, that could be three different events in one year that you would need to see your financial advisor for. And it's important that any changes that you make, you actually have that discussion. A good financial advisor will help you source a proper um, loan. If, you, if you're looking to purchase a car or a bond, they'll help you with all of that. That's when you know you actually have the right relationship with them. The minimum, as I've said, the minimum time to see your financial advisor is at least once a year but you can see them more often than that if it's needed. So what is it that we're looking for? And we don't expect that, that everything in the, in, the, in the pillars of financial planning are addressed immediately. It's a process, but it's important that you address those things that are most important to you at that time first. And everybody's situation is different, but the pillars are investment planning, retirement planning, income protection, Severe illness, that's the dreaded diseases, disability benefits, your life cover, and medical aid. And very often, we also look at the short term, but a lot of people don't always do that. They don't always look at that. When you're buying cars or you're buying a house, you go and you insure it. It's normally the first thing you have to do. And I think most of the companies, it's compulsory. And they ask you to present that every year to show that it's insured. So you do that. You go on to a medical aid because those are the things that are important. But the one thing that we actually don't look at first is our biggest asset. Our biggest asset is the thing we take most for granted. And what's that? That's you. That's your ability to earn an income. And when you come out from here, that's what you're going to be doing. And we, because we think that we're infallible, we're young, 
You know, any, nothing is going to happen to you that's not something that you look out for. So we really would like you to, to think about what we're coming through with to start with, starting from today, the ideas that we're coming through in terms of the process, what it is that you will need to look at. And what we've done is you'll see there are, are in the group, there are three financial advisors that are able to provide you with the kind of information that you're looking for. So on the screen, you'll see three of their names. There's three different people with their email addresses and their cells. You can just take a picture of it. But below that is a link with a QR code. And we would very much like for you to go onto the system and either through the code or the link and, and put yourselves on there. But we have something more. Always with Sundam, there's something more. What we have done, thank you to these advisors and our team, they have sponsored some prizes. So every week, and they're not um, um, a little, little prizes, they're really nice things that you will enjoy and you will get great use out of going forward. So every week there will be a, a, a draw and every week somebody will be announced as having received the prize for the full 10 weeks that we go through. So please, will you actually go on and make sure that you register so that we can, we can spoil you in our little way. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michelle. Thank you for taking us through the what and the why and the how. I really appreciate the support again from Sandam. And just to confirm, guys, there's going to be prizes every week. So Marilyn from Sandam has put up a link on the chat box. Uh, please, can you guys follow that link and enter the competition so you guys can win some of these amazing prizes? Thank you again to Michelle. Um, I would like to now welcome uh, Mohammed again, who's going to be introducing us to Carlos, who is our keynote speaker for the evening. Welcome, Mohammed. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you very much. I hope that uh, our attendees are back in action and finished filling in that uh, prizes for. Uh, it's really my uh, pleasure to be here today and to see that uh, our idea at UKZ and civil engineering has came to life thanks to the collaboration uh, with SciC Durban and Sanlam Life. Uh, so uh, we are appreciated for this. And uh, it's also my pleasure to introduce our speaker for the first uh, talk and we uh, decided to start big by in, bringing in uh, a major key player in uh, the area of civil engineering. Our speaker is Carlos Stevens. He is a well-known figure in the world of transportation uh, thanks to his almost 40 years of experience. He graduated from the University of Natal, which is now part of UKZN, so we can consider him our graduate. Uh, he got a PSC and then a master degree as well. He's a SIC member and a professional engineer. Carlos also lectured as a part-time at both DUT and UKZN. So he is not a stranger uh, uh, for academia. Uh, looking into his CV would have taken the whole day. So I tried to pick up uh, very interesting points. Uh, he has a huge number, he has attended a huge number of technical and management courses. Uh, he is currently an independent consultant. And this is after he has spent a lot of time working with Etiquini, I think about 14 years. Uh, before that, he worked at several uh, engineering entities. Uh, during his time with Etiquini, he was the project executive for Go Derba. That's why he is the first person to talk about it and to share his experience. So, uh, Carlos, over to you. Oh, uh, good evening. Um, let me try and share some a screen with you just to context that I started university when we still use slide rules uh, and you can go and ask uh, your prof or whatever what a slide rule is 
hopefully you can see that. Okay, so the, I, I, I titled this uh, presentation, What's It? Because you may have seen as you go around uh, Durban, you'll see roads under construction and uh, various uh, bits of, of infrastructure. They have a, a sign in that says, Go Durban. This will be important for uh, graduates to understand a little bit of the interface between transportation and the resultant infrastructure. As all good uh, students would know, we need to have some sort of problem statement and a problem statement here would be focused around uh, things like developing countries of which South Africa is one and with large populations, which we have relatively large population compared with most countries in Europe and often low income population, which is where we sit. They need to be able to move their population at affordable rates as their public transport has to be affordable. One of the difficulties that was faced was that when you start looking at the capacity of your various public transport modes, so let's assume the normal bus uh, and the mini bus has a slightly lower capacity depending on circumstances, but let's assume the bus has a capacity Sorry, around 3,000. Sorry, Sorry, I'm just going to stop you for a second. Sorry, um, I don't think we can see your screen. Can you just uh, try and share it again, please? Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, that's perfect. Uh, you just need to open the PowerPoint again. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I was saying that um, the classical bus mode is about 3,000 people per hour. And uh, if we look at a slide like this, uh, you'll see that uh, the bus motor sits down here somewhere at the three to 5,000, somewhere there. And then the next mode, which is light rail, um, we know for a fact costs, uh, let's take an example in New York in 2017, they built a, about a three kilometer piece of underground, the Metro type, and it cost about 20 billion rand, and most uh, developing countries just cannot afford uh, the capital cost of going from an all bus mixed traffic type service uh, to go to rail. So in, in light of that, the uh, decision was to take it to a, um, a, uh, a new type of, of facility uh, and the whole BRT uh, started, and the BRT, as you can see over here, uh, sits at around 40,000, which significantly closes the gap between the bus um, mode and the light rail and the heavy rail modes, uh, which have the uh, 60, 40, 50, 60,000 capacity. So when one speaks of BRT, uh, bus, uh, bus rapid transit, um, the question might arise, so, where did this all start? I mean, historically, there were busways. Various countries tried to improve the capacity of the bus systems as they move through the uh, city traffic. They might have localized improvements. Um, and then along came a country like Brazil and the city Curitiba uh, in, in the 70s and 80s. They uh, developed a concept about as an above ground underground. So what they did is they tried to uh, take some of the benefits of, an, uh, of the underground, the metro, and to uh, mimic it on the surface. So it was typically a closed system with prepaid boarding. It 
uh, was developed as a radial and circumferential uh, configuration. So you could go from the city center outwards, it would intercept with the radial routes. The point was you could transfer anywhere along the route in literally a tube. So if you go to Curitiba, you'll see there's tubes. And uh, these uh, tubes, as long as you're in the tube or in the bus, you don't have to pay another ticket uh, as you do the metro, depending on the route. So that was what Curitiba did. Um, and that was the next step. Then from Curitiba, we found the BRT evolution, as it were. The BRT basically stepped uh, into this underground, above ground concept and try to uh, extend the underground concept a bit further by creating a dedicated right of ways and giving them greater priority on the surface. There were some small BRTs implemented uh, across the world, but the one that really uh, brought everything to uh, fruition or to brought uh, into the world stage was one in, in Bogota. In fact, at one stage, there was kind of transport tourism. So many countries, so many cities sent delegations to Bogota in Colombia to go and see their Trans Millennia, which was initiated in the year 2000. And it started uh, entrenching this whole BRT concept. It has since expanded into various South American cities, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, and other countries. And it's also come across in some uh, sense to Europe. In South Africa, a uh, proponent of BRT, Dr. Lloyd Wright, he's got an organization called Viva. He came in, into the country and he promoted this. And so I wanted to ask the question, so what makes a BRT a BRT and not just a busway? Well, they're kind of, I've listed there the uh, sort of four uh, defining features. The first is that the corridor or the the length of dedicated lanes, which are ex exclusive to the uh, bus system, are dedicated at least three kilometers. That's the one box you got to tick. The second is that I'll show you just now the scoring system, which will score four or more points in the dedicated right of way element. You've got to score four or more points in a busway alignment element. And then you're going to score 20 or more points across all five BRT basics. Now, what happened is an uh, uh, organization uh, basically set together some standards. But before you get into the standards, just so you get a sense of what a BRT is, uh, you have terminals at either end in, in either a, a, a stop or a staging area. You have dedicated uh, right of ways. Uh, connecting the two along the way you'll have stations and you may have park and rides and other precinct facilities uh, typically on either end you'll have depots to uh, hold the buses uh, the trunk route buses and, and the feeder buses and we'll uh, read more, we'll talk more about that just now and then on the way you may have transfer stations which facilitate corridor to corridor transfers you have a typically a control center that monitors the movements and, and the actual commuting and makes information available to keep the system alive and active and effective uh, throughout. In the control center, you, are, you have CCTV, electronic ticketing, and all sorts of backroom stuff, which we'll touch on a bit later on, um, broadly called ICT and also an integrated fare management. So that's kind of the system that would uh, govern the BRT. But just going back, uh, speaking about the standard, BR, the BRT standard was established. It's a, a document which defines a whole bunch of categories of, of uh, aspects of the bus rapid transit. And for each of the uh, um, categories, there's sub points. And each sub point, you can score uh, points depend based on the standard, which helps you to decide what score you're going to have. So, for example, under basic BRT basics, 
page 14 to 23, you can read it and tell you how you'd score the dedicated right of way, the bus way alignment, et cetera, et cetera. And so the dedicated right of way, you have to score a minimum of four to meet the BRT tick the box. The bus way alignment in terms of priority, you'd have to score a minimum of four. And where it sits, it's in the median, it's in the middle of the road. And then in this uh, subcategory, which you can score maximum of 38, you have to score a minimum of 20. So as you go through, you have service planning, multiple routes, and all the various components that make up uh, a BRT that can be introduced into a BRT and can be adjusted. So your hours of operation might start off lower, and then eventually you hopefully you'll have a 24-hour service, and then you can you score infrastructure if you have passing lanes, depending what they are, you get the scores, and you go through this whole system where it establishes a standard, a benchmark, which places your BRT in terms of the quality, perceived quality of service that it is offering to the commuter and to your uh, residents of your city. Along the way, you also have point deductions. So if you have low frequency of buses in the off-peak, uh, like you can lose points. So it's almost like a monopoly game or a game. You can win points and you can lose points depending how effective your services and your system is. And of course, everybody wants a gold. If you have the Olympics, well, we all aim for gold. Uh, and it's, it's quite a sophisticated system that attains uh, a gold. But uh, you can see that the minimum is bronze, and, and since 20 is where you start a BRT, between having a BRT and scoring a bronze, uh, there's quite a, um, a large section. Now, Etiquini, uh, in prior to 2010, um, had effectively limited or no public transport service outside the peak house. Um, I know students, even the last five or six years, if they have to travel, say, from um, one of the mainland suburbs, from, say, North Dean in uh, Queensborough, out that way, and they had to travel to Westville somewhere, they'd have to, have to catch, wait for the taxi to be full before they could move on the service, etc. So that was one of the, there was a situation for determined on the number, uh, the uh, availability of passengers before the service actually moved. So what we found is that scheduled services covered a maximum of 50% of our city. Um, and there were problems with the capacity. So during peak hours, there were long queues and there still are. Uh, safety difficulties, often record of accidents along the way. People sometimes are quite scared to climb into our uh, public transport because of, of safety and security issues. Um, the demand for travel during our peak hours is not uh, met by the supply. If you don't use our public transport on a regular basis, it's, it's actually extremely difficult. If you ask the average uh, person in, in, in a suburb, how do I get from point A to point B using a bus or minibus? Many, many people uh, who don't use the service regularly won't know uh, how to go about finding out the information. Currently, there's also a lot of duplication of our service. So here's a picture of this, is the, was the extent of the area that covered about 50% of our population with scheduled services. In other words, there's a timetable, and the buses run on a defined route at specific times and hours as set down in their schedules. But that service um, covered only 50%. Uh, the, the balance of the service was through unscheduled services, they operated on in times and hours that suited them. And uh, often in off peak, the vehicle would only move when there's enough passengers to make it financially viable. And it's uh, classically known that it has a uh, poor safety record. The other problem as a whole with the with this system that we still have in operation is that it's not easily upgradable as a system. 
it's extremely, extremely difficult. In fact, I would suggest to say it's not upgradable. And so around 2010, 2011, the city, the, the National Department of Transport decided there was a need for paradigm shift, and they uh, brought on board this BRT, this bus rapid transit uh, concept, and offered it to the uh, metros, particularly. This was ahead of 2010 World Cup. And they had certain standards where this BRT was going to go. The target, it must cover 85% of all residents in the city, in the metro, must be within 500 meters walking distance to the BRT. It must be universally accessible and it must be non-motorized transport supportive. In other words, it must have good sidewalks, uh, support cycling to and from the stations, etc. The bus lanes must be in the median, that is in the middle of the road, and the stations must be in the median in the middle of the road. That's a BRT requirement. It must integrate with other transport modes like rail and other bus systems. The fare collection, the ticketing system effectively must be electronic and it must be collected electronic through a tap and enter system. It must be developmental and it must be inclusive of current service providers. In other words, it must transform the mini bus taxi and the current bus services into organized inclusive operators to run uh, the, the BRT service, the BRT system as it were. And it must aim for zero operating subsidy uh, for the operating costs. So, so the capital cost to build things, the treasury and national would help. But once the service starts running, you would have to as a city or as a, as a, as a system cover all your own costs. So this is what the picture looked like, targeting 80%, 85% of the population. Uh, and there's again, some of the targets, the headway, maximum headway permitted was 30 minutes. That's the time from bus to bus, one bus going to another bus going. Uh, and that's quite a long time. So in other words, you, it means that the average person might have to wait 30 minutes. And obviously in the morning and the afternoon, uh, that's unacceptable. And so you would target about a five or eight minute headway as a maximum in your peak hour and 30 minutes in the off peak. They were targeting 18 hours of operation. So roughly from 4 a.m. Uh, right through till um, 10 p.m. or 6 a.m., whatever. So that you 18 hours of operation and prepaid boarding. You, know, you must pay for your ticket before you actually get onto the bus. So Gerd Durban uh, was initiated in about 2012. It uh, took this BRT concept. Uh, by this stage, uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town, Rio Via and my city had some system going. But their planning, their modeling was largely on just the corridor that they were taking to, to construction. Etiquini decided that it wanted to know what the end picture would be like for the whole city when it was transporting 85% of its residents. So it did a wall-to-wall -wall analysis. It looked at the entire city, the transport model for the entire city, and the transport modeling guys did a lot of background work um, using the... Uh, quality of life surveys, uh, tra traffic and transport surveys, and all and different surveys across the city, where they were able to develop a transport model, which uh, helped them define where the trunk corridor alignments would be and what would be typical demands, uh, passenger demands on those trunk corridors. They took it a step further. They did further modeling to take the uh, demand uh, passenger demand down to station by station on those corridors and to establish a series of trunk corridors. And this is just one of the early versions. So there would be corridors linking Amlazi through to uh, uh, Kwamashu, through to Phoenix and, and right through to the uh, King Shark uh, International Airport. There'd be trunk corridors going up towards uh, Hammerdale and Pumalanga from via Chatsworth, um, 
So you can see there'd be a series of trunk corridors and they would be the BRT corridors. They would carry the bulk uh, of your people across the whole city. With the additional modeling, the corridors themselves did not bring the service to within 500 meters of all the residents. So two additional layers were then uh, modeled and uh, designed as it were. The first was a trunk uh, and, and um, a feeder service, the feeder service to the trunks, that's the red uh, dotted lines on the left. And they would bring people to the stations as a, a collect and distribution mini service to the station of the trunk service. Um, but the, the understanding was that there were certain origin and destinations which had enough demand to have their own uh, service. And so complementary or quality bus service routes were also um, designed and, and conceptualized where there was not enough demand to warrant a trunk service, but there was enough demand to uh, warrant a standard bus service, quality bus service. So we have here the nine corridors schematically and the phases that were conceptualized. The first phase was corridor C1, which is uh, one of the green lines from the city center through to um, just past Kwamashu at the interface between Inanda and Phoenix called Bridge City. The second corridor was C2, which is effectively the rail corridor between Bridge City, running through the city center through to Amlazi. That was corridor C2. C3, C3 was a proposed new corridor link between Bridge City across the Amgani Valley through Quarabeka. New Germany to Pinetown. And then C9 was the extension, as it were, of the C3 corridor running through Phoenix, uh, the Conubia development that was being, uh, conceptualized at the time through to Schlanger. So that was phase one. And that was uh, targeted to, to capture 65% uh, of, of the ridership. Just to understand. The scope of that when we get to infrastructure. So there's the phase one uh, that was um, put on the table to start off with and, and taken to National Department of Transport. And uh, just to understand that there was from the beginning an intention to integrate between rail and, and the road service. So the right of way development. Um, Articulated buses on a dedicated right away. This is one of the South American examples. So the Rose guys started developing a bunch of cross sections. Typically, the bus riding in the median with the station space, six meter typical for a station uh, with, with the mixed traffic on either side. It, it's a quick, it's a particular challenge without terrain. We often have to have retaining walls. Uh, to ensure that the, the cross fall and super elevation, et cetera, were acceptable. And obviously brought complications with drainage at, at these points. Uh, the busways were nominal three and a half meter lane. Um, and in places where it was on a high order provincial road, a New Jersey barrier would be required between the busway, the right of way, and uh, the um, and the mixed traffic. So, and a series of cross sections were done for each of the corridors all the way along. Um, so, some of the standards what that the cross section had to obviously, it was only one lane in each direction. So, it had to uh, allow if a bus broke down for the buses to under emergency to, to bypass them. So, there was no center median in the busway. The, divide, the division occurred on the outside edges of the two lanes, separating the busway, the right of way from the mixed traffic. Bus lanes at stay, and I'll speak a bit more about that shortly. So bus lanes, uh, bypass lanes only be provided if more than one corridor uses the same right of way. So in some instances, 
to have C1 and C3 sharing a right of way. And along that stretch, any station there would have to allow bypass lanes at the station so that the C1 bus or the C3 bus would not hold up the other, the other corridor um, if there were different demand volumes and different uh, frequencies. Secondly, if the projected demand required more than 80 buses per hour, just to understand that's about 45 seconds every, uh, between buses. That's the sort of numbers we're talking about when you're trying to move uh, sort of 10,000 people in an hour. Thirdly, if there was a recognized express service from the beginning and it was prioritized as a need, then bypass lanes would need to be provided to stations uh, to allow the express service to bypass uh, buses that were stopping at every station. So this is a, quite a becker. This is a, a photograph taken during construction. Um, just to focus on a, on a couple of things for the pavement guys, that the pavement guys will realize that the bus tracking is constrained and therefore it's susceptible to rutting. And so the pavement uh, design is substantial. Um, it's relatively stiff because it has to, in our warm climate, resist deformation. Um, and at the stations, uh, the stopping place uh, of where the bus is stopped had to be obviously diesel uh, resistant because if there was going to be any dripping of oils or diesel to be at the, at the stations. And obviously, as the bus slow down, stopped, you get heavier loading and potential for deformation. So that portion of the right of way was, in fact, um, treated with um, salvia sim, which is a special proprietary product to protect the right of way. You can see, we'll talk more about this. There's a bridge, an overhead bridge, and there's a proposed uh, lift structure on, on, on the station platform because every station has to be universally accessible. Now it has to be accessible for uh, people who have uh, wheelchairs, uh, old elderly people, walkers, uh, small children, it has to be universally accessible. Um, so that, that was the, the right of ways we were concerned in the station design. Stations that to be universally accessible within the station and walking to the station, we had to deal with the precinct as being universally accessible. The station itself had to accommodate ticketing office toilets, uh, the passenger gates, the server room to handle all the electronics for, for the communication and information transfer, a generator room to allow for uninterrupted power supply. The minimum station size was for a single articulated bus. An articulated bus has a capacity of about 100 to 120 people. So it's uh, somewhat uh, larger than the current buses. A typical bus is about 12 meters. An articulated bus is nominally about 19 or 20 meters long. The maximum from a practical perspective was two articulated buses for the station with independent arrival and departure. So that the space between the buses stopping point to allow them to move. The platform had to be level, flat, 0%, which was interesting and challenging in the Durban uh, terrain. Um, and eventually the universal access um, sector conceded to allow a maximum, an absolute maximum of 2% longitudinal gradient uh, on the platform, especially when we get quite a becker region where the, the roadway sits at 100 meter long station uh, in the middle of along this uh, to 10 meter level floor for loading in other words between the bus and the station there can be no steps and you have to be able to walk straight from the plat the station platform into the bus an automated uh, station door so when the bus stops the bus doors open and the station doors open simultaneously. So here's a schematic, uh, center platform, you have your ticket office, server room and all the rest there. You have gates, waiting and boarding. It's an enclosed, it's a closed system. You pay before you go 
through the gates to get in, like the underground, the metros overseas. And then you have an emergency uh, exit and, and we had a, a sump at the back here where the generator could be housed. Just understand that the buses let the people in the right hand side, which is different from a normal bus in our environment where the doors of the bus are on the left hand side. So you couldn't just bring an ordinary bus onto the BRT busway because it, it had to then have doors on both sides or doors on the right hand side, which would mean it couldn't go on the mixed traffic to drop people off on the left. So there's a whole logistic requirement to understand that aspect. So the configuration, the demand for the peak hour will determine whether you need a single or double berth whether you could use a standard or articulated bus, whether you need to have independent bus and arrival. In other words, could a bus arrive and go around the bus in front of them? Uh, you know, there was enough space without having to reverse. It was dependent on the number of routes using that station, whether there were bypass lanes, whether there were express services. So there are a whole lot of issues. So this is a, a schematic just to show you that in, in it, it's a query for the Go Durban, you have, um, a feeder facility which is offline. The feeder services come and they drop people off. The people then have to walk across to the station, get into the station to transfer from the feeder facility to the trunk station. And that was a very, 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 very long debate uh, between us and uh, between the city and national transport. So here's a station uh, that's been constructed at night time. Uh, some tongue in cheek about it looked a bit like a UFO, uh, but really trying to pick up the standard and, and the closed system um, and the quality of the service. You can see the size of the station. These stations are about six meters wide, uh, and they're typically between 50 and 70 meters long. So there are significant structures uh, that have been constructed the size of about, about a small mini factory. Some of the other system components, just to touch on them, automatic fare system, you've seen them in metros, electronic gates, you tap with your electronic card, it opens and you go in. Um, it has to be prepaid, so your electronic card has to have money on it. Um, it has to be able to track your time of entry and exit from your feeder bus because you've got to walk across to get from the feeder service to the trunk service without having to pay for another ticket. That was a big debate. The station gates have to be universally accessible. You can see this gate is special to allow uh, wheelchairs through. And not only wheelchairs, but things like prams and, and other um, non-motorized and uh, larger objects through. Um, it has to be bypass resistant, which was found in South America. So typically at our end of the world, these uh, there are uh, areas above here with a screen to prevent people jumping over these, uh, these paddle gates that we have. Passenger information system, this is to provide a person who's waiting for the bus to know when is the next bus, where is it going, etc. It's real time, so all the buses are tracked and people are told uh, in the station through electronic variable message signs um, when the next bus is expected and um, where it's traveling to, which routes are going, what's its destination. Public trial management information, this tracks the actual vehicles and this is for uh, contracts, uh, operating contracts to pay the operators in terms of their travel and how they behave. Uh, do they speed? Do they uh, drive badly? To also relays the information to support the passenger information system, tells them the system where the bus is and how long it's going to take to get to the next station. CCTV along the way in the stations for safety and security and to deal with incidents if a bus breaks down or if there's a security uh, problem. Wayfinding system, this is the signage that tells you how to get to the station, where's the entrance. Um, and what route is it and all those good things so that you have a, what they call a legible system that you understand how to get into the system, where you are traveling to, which route, 
where you must transfer from which route to which route to get to your destination. And the wayfinding system covers the broader uh, station precinct. Just quickly, we did 25 kilometers corridor C3 linking Pine Town to Bridge City. Uh, it's from Pine Town to Nanda, roughly. It's a single lane with bypass at stations where the future C1 corridor runs. So that's uh, more or less those of you who know the area from uh, Malandela through to Bridge City. There's uh, four stations there bypassed because that's part of the future corridor C1 currently under construction. If you go out onto the Mullandella Road, in Nanda Road, then see Cow Lake, you'll see construction. That's part of the future C1 corridor. You'll see a couple of photographs of the extreme terrain through quite a Baker Valley. Uh, and I'll go show you some stats just now. Massive retaining walls um, and, and the station construction is quite unique. Just to note that some of the final portions are still under construction. Uh, they in quite a Baker and in Bridge City. A few uh, fuzzy photographs. Uh, the layer works in progress. Uh, just to highlight, we were at one stage spending 100 million rand a month. That's right, 100 million rand a month. We had nine contracts going simultaneously. Um, and eventually, the, the uh, expenditure was of the order of 2.8 billion rand. Um, for the uh, infrastructure. You can see in the middle one above layer works, that's the Quadebeca roller coaster ride dropping into the Quadebeca Valley. Uh, bottom right hand is the right of way winding its way up the Quadebeca Valley. You can see uh, the sort of uh, terrain that we're involved in. It was a substantial project. We had to build a number of bridges, interchanges. Um, it cost between 80 and 100 million a kilometer for the right of way. But just compare that with a light rail, which would cost between four and 600 million rand a kilometer. And the underground, which in New York in 2017, cost about 20 billion rand. So, Order of magnitude. So more the construction where this, these are fairly old, 2017 sort of photographs. You can go and drive along this route. Um, it's main road 577 through Pine Town and out onto the R103. So just some of the stats as we wind up three and as design engineers, 22 months from design to construction, 28 kilometers, uh, what did I say 24, 2.5 billion, beg your pardon, 28 kilometers of right of way. Uh, 60,000 cubic meters of asphalt, 15 stations, five uh, interchanges, 21 signal intersections, 29 kilometers of reinforced concrete New Jersey barriers, 46,000 square meters of retaining wall over just a five kilometer stretch, 70 kilometers of pipes for services, telecom and the guys. We laid one kilometer of a thousand uh, millimeter diameter steel water main because it ran under the right of way uh, in the future and we had to put it so we didn't have to dig the right of way in the future and about six kilometers of 300 to 500 millimeter diameter water pipe. So I closed out, go to Durban as a concept seeks to bring the BRT transport model as a base to frame an integrated multimodal transport system for its equity. And its desire is to meet the current and the future mobility demands of its residents. It can adjust city to all its residents to be able to crisscross the city. And it also has the opportunity to set a visionary developmental potential to restructure the city into a more just, equitable, and livable city. Flight, flight, Mr. Trude, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Carl. Yeah, thank you very much, Carlos. It was super informative. And um, yeah, uh, you got me at 100 million rand per month. That, that was incredible. Um, so this yeah. Is uh, challenging. So, 
So, uh, Mohammed, do you want to take us through some questions? I don't know if there's some on the chat box. Um, I see one on my side, which maybe I'll get through first. Uh, two, actually, that I could answer. One is, are we recording and will these recordings be shared? Yes, we are definitely recording. And yes, we will be sharing these with uh, all attendees and actually all our members from SICE. I will obviously extend that in that link to the students at UKZN as well. And uh, one for Carlos, I'm not sure if you're in the right position to answer this, but if you're not, you can just point us in the right direction. We've had a question regarding um, how students can go about getting vacation work on one of these sites. They can uh, apply to the city um, and uh, through their normal channels, through the HR in the city um, and uh, inform themselves in that manner. Okay, I'm gonna hand over to Mohammed to go through the rest of the questions. Thank you very much, Sharon. And again, thank you very much, Carlos. It was very informative and uh, exciting as expected. Uh, I have some questions down here, but uh, let's start with the questions from the audience. We start with Isona. Uh, the question is about the type of modeling to build the uh, trunk corridors. And uh, is it uh, a micro simulation modeling or what, what type of modeling? No, so I'm, I'm not a modeler, so because I'm in the infrastructure side, it was not a micro simulation. It was uh, basically an ME4 uh, type modeling, um, sort of fairly high level because it was a network, uh, broad network. Um, and so the modeling was more at that level rather than micro simulation. Okay, we have a question from Ayanda, and I think I saw a question on the chat as well regarding the same. When do we expect the first pass to run? And uh, oh, again, when do we expect this project to finish? I think it will not finish in the near future, uh, but at least when to expect the first pass to run. Okay, so I'm not with the city anymore, but the we we dealt with the infrastructure and the there were plans to already have uh, services running, uh, even though portions were under construction. The intention at the time was to start the service um, with part of the service being under construction, but one has to understand that this is a restructuring of the public transport system which includes the minibus taxi industry. Um, and so I can't uh, comment on when it's expected. I would like to see it running sooner rather than later, uh, but that's where it sits. You'd have to uh, address that to the Etiquini Transport Authority, who are the uh, transport authority who's implementing this project. Thank you. I think Kurt is asking the same question about the taxi association's perception. So how do they receive this? And uh, are they supportive? As with any tax industry, obviously any change, especially a, a significant change like this, uh, makes the people who have a, a, a livelihood sensitive to it. So the, uh, when we started, there was a memorandum of understanding concluded with the industry. Um, at the moment, I don't know. Uh, my understanding is there is a tacit agreement uh, um, that the service uh, will proceed, but, but you'd have to address again that question to uh, the Transport Authority, Etiquini. All right. I think the following question is more or less uh, within the same uh, about the taxi rank from... Uh, so I think this is answered. Uh, we have a very good, interesting question from Mohammed about, uh, not me, from another Mohammed, about the renewable energy. And uh, I support this question. So uh, are we going to see the usage of renewable energy? Uh, and he is giving an example about the solar power in the stations. Uh, so what, what do you think? Okay, so the... 
renewable energy, in fact, the whole sustainability um, profile was uh, evaluated um, during the uh, design phase, including putting solar panels on the roofs, uh, water collection through the system, um, and, and you know, the possibility of wind and all the rest. So there are gaps or there are opportunities for renewable energy to be brought in. Um, I, but I'm not aware of any of them uh, yet being implemented. Uh, some uh, the, where the, the greatest opportunity arose was at the depots where solar roofs were definitely um, economically and financially viable at the time. Uh, but at, at other locations, it, it was more difficult. There were small portions of uh, renewable energy uh, in, in the budgets uh, at the time in terms of smaller solar panels to drive things like CCTV and to try and give uh, support, UPS support to stations, etc. Um, but they would be, uh, they've been uh, um, factored into the designs, but they haven't been implemented. I, I would expect that when the service starts, then these sort of overlays would, would kick in as for, in, when the service starts because of the nature of the infrastructure that needs to be placed at its vulnerability if it's not being used. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, Sadna, uh, but the question about the taxi industry, which has been addressed. Uh, the next question from Ransetsa, it's uh, how does integrated transport plan feature in the PRT system? Let me amend the question and uh, make it how does the PRT system integrated in the uh, integrated public transportation system? So the integrated transport plan uh, has the BRT and it's obviously a transition. So that's why we had the phase one looking at the, at the initial corridors. Um, and so the, the transition is about uh, um, partnering with the uh, minibus operators, the taxi operators where they will establish um, operating entities to be part of the, of the system. So they would not they would in fact transform to in a sense uh, run parts of the system um, and um, to be the operators and owners of, of large portions of the system. So as the system would come into the area, they would, would transform a business model uh, in, in conjunction with the city and, and the particular transport authority and the support. And they would eventually uh, be part of the system and part of the uh, owners of the system, as it were. Okay. Uh, uh, colleagues, I see that some questions are posted in the chat. Please post your questions in the Q&A section so that we so can- I saw, I, I saw one in the, in, the, in the chat asking about why are the lanes in the middle of the road? In other words, why the median lanes? The, the major difference is that the BRT paradigm shift is where the bus has priority over the private motor vehicle. So it then means that if you have the buses in the middle, your left turns uh, and, and your impedance of uh, parking and stopping of, of the mixed traffic doesn't affect the bus. In the South American context, uh, the turning across the BRT are, are actually prohibited. So you have to, in our case, you'd be forced to turn left and go around the block and intercept the BRT at 90 degrees. You would not have a right turn phase for mixed traffic. In our uh, first corridor, in the city's first corridor, CE3, they do have a right turn signal phase, um, but they have a protected phase for the bus. The other, uh, so it's, it's about the, the, the travel time and the guarantee of travel time of the bus vehicle. So you want to not have, have as little possibility of the bus movement being interrupted by uh, parked cars and stop cars and those things. Hence the divider between the BRT lanes and the mixed traffic lanes in the middle of the road. 
it does bring other challenges, but that's another issue. Yeah. Uh, we, are, we are compounded with questions, so I'll try to be as quick as possible. We have one from Jabolo about access to uh, the station. So he says in that cross section you have uh, given, uh, the station is on one side of the road at the location. How will passengers from the other side access the station? I'm not sure with the station on one side, but they would use the stations have a traffic signal which uh, allows pedestrians to cross into the middle but every station is designed on the brt to have a overhead uh, bridge pedestrian bridge uh, with universal access to be retrofitted so if you went into the stations in pine town where there's a big a name board there's actually a base for a future bridge configuration to be uh, provided, as has happened in the Quadebeka Wirebank station. Great. Uh, the following question is from our esteemed colleague, Dr. Justin Bengel, uh, about uh, how future proof is the system. So, can uh, the scale of change in the, the climate change can uh, affect this uh, project? And if so, how? Okay, that's uh, uh, beyond my. Uh, that's a, a difficult one. <laughs> yes, we, we considered uh, we considered uh, electric at the time, but uh, there there was logistics and uh, other reasons why the introduction of, of electric uh, vehicles. The the, the 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 city I know has pursued the option of battery operated vehicles and is continuing to track that as an option. Um, so it depends on which aspects, because it's quite a, a, a loaded question. Uh, let me try to add something here. Uh, I think we are a little bit late in terms of PRT, the, which is already uh, used in different uh, uh, countries around the world. Uh, but definitely the, the trend is to go into mass transportation. And uh, PRT can be used as a foundation for any future developments in mass transportation. And it can be also adapted to climate change conditions. Uh, using renewable energy is one of the things. And uh, of course, electric buses uh, can be also uh, 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 adopted. And uh, it is uh, not very flexible, but it's also not rigid enough uh, to uh, not accept any, any changes in the future. Uh, so thanks, Justin, for the question. Then we have a question from Juan Domosa, a little bit long one. Uh, he wanted to say that he noticed many bus taxis with the uh, Go Durban branding, and he didn't understand the concept. So now he understands it. Thank you. Uh, recent graduate, I'd like to know if any means are being made to help us part of what well, we answered this question before. Thank you. Then we move to the following one from Motsa. What kind of protection mechanism has been incorporated from a design perspective to ensure vandalism doesn't take place or is minimized? I think we can elaborate a little bit here because it's, it's uh, 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 safety and security is a major concern. Uh, especially in KwaZulu Natal after what happened recently. So everyone will be uh, curious to know, uh, are there special measures uh, compared to what we have seen overseas when uh, we are going to uh, start operating with this PRT system? Okay, again, this would probably be better answered with uh, by the uh, current uh, Integrity Transport Authority officials who are doing the project, but certainly the intention was that, that the communities around the stations would be fundamental to, to, and to be part of, as it were, running the stations. And it would be almost like a cooperative um, model for the system so that the community, in a sense, own the system. So that at a the, at the very broad level would be to try and, and uh, devolve uh, the activities that would, would be required and the benefits that would be derived, economic and other, from the system to the communities around the system. 
There's obviously CCTV uh, proposed along the entire corridor to be able to have surveillance. Um, and, and the stations are, are designed to be able to, to lock down. But obviously, if a community is uh, vehemently opposed, then there is really very little uh, one can do. And the best form of, of security is to ensure that the community uh, is in support of what is there. As happened recently, where communities went out and protected shopping centers from being vandalized because they took ownership of it, that would have to be the, the mindset. Yeah, I agree. And I also think that in terms of uh, security, there is a need to uh, have uh, good security at the, at the stations. Uh, otherwise, this will be... Uh, oh, yes, there's security at every station. That's a given. Uh, a question from Ayanda about the competitiveness to many pass industries. So in other words, why shall one use the PRT while they can pay less in a mini bus? No, the BRT is benchmarked, and that's one of the, the challenges, benchmarked, because it's a cooperative, it has to be targeting a cooperative, because the mini bus becomes part of the system. In some form, they would uh, might uh, be feeders or whatever, however it, it, it pans out. But the, the fares are, are uh, benchmarked against mini bus taxi fares. So there's obviously a subsidy that's involved. Uh, uh, Georgie, I think we answered this question. Uh, then we have a question from Mieza. Has there been any provision made to create for the breakdown of the pass at the stations? As we can see, there is only one lane. Yeah, that's a good question. What will happen if a pass is broken? So at, at the stations, um, the, 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 uh, the incident response model is that you can, you, in most instances in the urban area, you can access the right of way because the, um, the dividing curb is quasi mountable by large vehicles. Along the right of way itself, there is no, there's no divider between the opposing lanes. And so an incident management uh, um, overlay would, would come in and allow the buses to, almost in a stop-go control uh, environment, allow buses to uh, bypass on the opposing lane, as it were. But one I need to understand that in terms of the public transport information management system, the buses are tracked on a second-by-second -second basis, and therefore it the bus wouldn't remain there for extended periods. The moment there was a problem, the control center would know about it immediately, and, and obviously your response uh, vehicles would be uh, dispatched immediately. Uh, thanks, Carlos. I think we take uh, the last question from Yanni, uh, referring to Johannesburg system, the RT system, and the notice is the system uh, uh, are given right of way and their lines tend to take up a lot of space. Taxis end up driving in these lanes illegally. So why do these lanes are not become priority for other buses, taxis, et cetera, as well? Yeah, I can't. If, uh, if the, the, the management is clear, of, yeah. So the management yes, of the, the BRT uh, right of way is always going to be uh, a challenge. Until we have the transformation where the public transport system is, integ is fully integrated as a single system and all the players uh, are on, on, the same, uh, you know, on the same space, there'll always be this competition. So it becomes an enforcement issue and, and, and there's, there are challenges. There's no uh, getting away from that. And I think that all the cities are aware of those challenges, but I take everybody back that we have that quantum leap between what the current system can handle and what our cities require to be able to move in terms of numbers of people as we move into the future. All right, I think we answered all the questions. I have a list of my own questions, uh, but I don't think we have time for them. So I'll pick up only one. 
uh, being a pavement guy, couldn't uh, let your statement on pavement design go without a question. So uh, you said that, uh, uh, of course, rutting resistance and uh, diesel resistance are very important parameters when it comes to design of these lanes. Uh, but what type of pavement are we considering then? Is it normal flexible pavement? Are we considering new materials, uh, high modulus pavement? What are we considering then? Okay, so, and, and I'm a bit on the edge here because I didn't actually do the pavement design, but it's a high modulus pavement. And there are certain sections which actually introduced uh, concrete. And that's why at the stations and at certain, on certain, uh, in certain locations, the high modulus pavement was actually uh, protected against uh, you know, deformation and oil spillage, et cetera. And it's, it's in, in some places you actually got a, a weak concrete substructure um, for the support uh, in terms of what is required. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we covered all the questions and uh, Sharon, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Actually, Carlos, I had one question from my side. Um, so you mentioned that there's 80, there's, um, you guys are looking at 85% coverage through the country. How much of this coverage has been achieved like at this point? Okay, when you say you guys, uh, I'm not directly involved anymore, but it's not through the country, it's through the city for the metro. Oh, it's through the city, okay. It's for the metro. And obviously at the moment, the BRT has not yet been launched as a service as the uh, one uh, question was, when are the buses going to run? So for all intents and purposes, the scheduled bus service coverage at the moment is unchanged or I don't know, possibly even slightly lower now. I don't know. And infrastructure wise? Uh, how far uh, so, into it are we? So my understanding is that, uh, well, C3 is, uh, which links Pine Town to Bridge City is probably about 90% complete. I know that C1 and C9 are in different stages of construction in terms of the infrastructure. And C2 is obviously an existing rail service. And that has some challenges of its own, but so it is, it is progressing uh, in, in as far as there's still construction taking place in C1 and C9 at present. Okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you to you, Carlos, for that um, presentation. Highly informative. And um, I think that we have a lot to look forward to in this country if we manage to come to make this project come to fruition um, completely and fully. I just, I just am not sure about the zero cost subsidy uh, model being achieved, but yeah, that's uh, future problems to consider. But yeah, thank you again. And thank you so much to Mohammed as well for co-hosting this evening and obviously championing all the, the technical questions that, uh, that he is obviously the leading specialist in. Yeah, so that uh, brings us towards the end of our event. I'm not sure if my co-hosts want to turn off their cameras. They're more than welcome to, but it's fine if you want to leave it on as well. Um, yeah, I just want to express my appreciation again uh, to Sanlam for sponsoring this event and uh, for making this entire initiative possible. I think it's, uh, whilst we've opened it up to industry, it's such a huge, huge accomplishment for us as I see Durban in bringing our students closer to the industry, it's really been a challenge for us to be able to do that over the last year and a bit. Um, you know, that needs no explanation as to why. But this initiative is really uh, the road to a change for that. Um, I encourage all our attendees to enter the competition that Sandam is hosting. I'm not sure if Michelle wants to just uh, re attach the link onto the onto the chat box. Um, yeah, so uh, from Saisi Durban's side, I know we published, uh, I mentioned that we published our, our first Outlook magazine at our previous event, uh, which was uh, on the Msikapa River Bridge. And we want to do another Outlook uh, as soon as possible. So if anyone wants to write for us, uh, please contact Kavita. Um, her email address is the at 
And yeah, so with that, members, I am looking forward to next week. Our next speaker is Mr. Chris Main, and he's going, going to take us through the project uh, known as the Lower Amkamas Water Extraction Project. And we're looking forward to it. So same time, same place next week. And until then, have a great evening. Cheers and yeah, keep well. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night.